A very warm welcome to the discussion, where is freedom of expression going? I am Manuela kaspar Klarich and I am the editor-in-chief of Deutsche Welle, Germany's international broadcaster. And we are noticing that the expression of freedom of expression and of reporting is more and more difficult and more harder in today's world. And we are here to discuss this problem and learn what we can do about it. And you as the audience can later join and ask questions as well. And to kick off the discussion, I'd like to welcome now on the stage Tirana Hassan. She is executive director of the NGO Human Rights Watch. And she will give us an insight into what the rolling back of freedom of speech looks like. Thank you very much, Manuela. So this year, 4.2 billion people will be eligible to vote in national elections around the world. Now, if those elections are free and fair, it's a very important expression of the people's will. But far too often, the votes and our voices are undermined by creeping authoritarianism. That's where power is concentrated and applied just to favour a few. It's the difference between the rule of law, where laws apply to everyone equally, and rule by law, where the rules are used as an instrument of control. The warning signs, however, appear well before anyone starts their journey to the ballot box. Politicians, intent on grabbing power, have the same playbook. And it starts with concepts that seem quite harmless. It's concepts like protecting family values or safeguarding our traditions. But pay close attention to these concepts because they are often self-serving, manipulative, and they almost always harm people and restrict human rights. One example of this is how politicians demonize LGBT rights and identity. It, they created a mystery around it, somehow projecting that it undermines family and is corrupting children. And we have seen this in many countries, from Colombia to the United States. We've seen it from Russia to Hungary to Ghana. Another example is where women uh, where women's rights come under attack. What we've seen over the last few years is governments telling women where they can go, who they can go with, what they must wear, and whether they can be pregnant or not. Now, when we start seeing these sort of patterns, it is the first indication that society is becoming less free, less open, and less inclusive and women pay the price with their lives. This was most evident in 2020 in Poland, when the previous law and justice government virtually banned legal abortion. And we know that at least six women have died because doctors failed to terminate pregnancies despite complications. Political leaders' intent on consolidating power don't stop there. Civil society, and by that I'm talking about independent groups and activists, advocates who protect rights and free societies. We're talking about institutions like the free press, courts. These have become the new battlegrounds for autocratic leaders looking to eliminate scrutiny on their decisions and their actions. Let's take, for example, Tunisia. President Kay Saeed, elected in 2019, has steadily eliminated the checks and balances by weakening the judiciary, cracking down on political opponents and those that disagree, and targeting freedom of expression and the press. And then there is El Salvador. President Nayib Bukele has used mass detention of mostly low-income people as an ostensible solution for high levels of crime. Bukele's government has rounded up tens of thousands of people, including up to 2 
thousand children. He has used a state of emergency to essentially grab power, consolidate it. He has purged the Supreme Court, replacing the Attorney General and forcing some journalists into exile. And of course, there is the United States, where state legislatures and courts have weakened laws aimed at, at removing race-based restrictions on voting to a point that they're basically irrelevant today. In Florida and other United States, uh, in other states in the US, we have seen educational censorship, limiting students' abilities to learn about sexual, sexual and gender identity, as well as the history of slavery and racism. And politicians know that accurate information on these issues is just one factor that inspires people to participate in civic action and hold authorities to account. And governments are increasingly using technology platforms to silence critics and censor dissent, especially in countries that don't have robust independent judiciaries and oversight. Governments we've seen can implement laws that essentially become traps for critics. They, they actually have entrapped and arrested activists and even unsuspecting internet users. In one of the most extreme cases in Saudi Arabia, we saw the government has taken action against a 54-year-old retired teacher and sentenced him to death for his peaceful expression of his own opinions on X, formerly known as Twitter, and on YouTube. So why do governments target and weaken institutions like the courts? Why do they want to shrink civic space and silence dissent? It's because these provide the checks and balances on their power and they deliver victories for human rights. Like in Nepal, we have seen the Supreme Court order local authorities to register same-sex marriages. And it is just the latest in a long stream of rulings which have been guaranteeing the rights of LGBT people in the country. Or there's Brazil where the Supreme Court has upheld indigenous people's rights to their traditional lands, despite efforts to thwart that. The ruling was not only a huge boost to indigenous people's fight to preserve their way of life, but it was also critical when it comes to the fight against climate change, because we know that the demarcation of indigenous lands has been tried and tested and proven to be one of the most effective barriers to deforestation. Lawmakers, though, supported by the farm lobby, are now trying to work to actually get around this ruling. And then there's the UK, where the highest court unanimously found that Rwanda, because of its poor human rights record, is not a safe third country for asylum seekers. Now, the UK government has since introduced a bill to try and get around the court's ruling, but the government cannot legislate away the fact that Rwanda counters criticism with violence and abuse. These victories highlight tremendous power of independent, rights-respecting, inclusive institutions. And civil society plays a role to challenge those who wield power. Our role is to serve the public, their role, sorry, is to serve the public interest and chart a rights respecting path forward. But as we see in Brazil and in the UK, that, those victories are very fragile. All governments, should redouble efforts with friends and enemies alike to uplift institutions, to protect civic space wherever we see the threats to independent, uh, independent civic space and institutions and any ability that we have to hold those in power to account. We all have a role to play in fighting for human rights because protecting everyone's dignity gives the roadmap to build thriving and inclusive societies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tirana. Uh, 
And we go into the discussion, and I'd like to welcome Svetlana Tichanovskaya. She is the leader of the Democratic Forces of Belarus, and you were forced out of your own country, forced into exile for opposing Alexander Lukashenko. And Joe Kahn, the executive uh, editor of the New York Times. Svetlana, let me start with you. Just a simple question. How is the state of freedom of expression in your country? Uh, I might answer that uh, it's on the lowest level. Because uh, in Belarus, people uh, don't dare to have their personal opinion, especially if this opinion in the political field. Uh, you know, my, my political journey also started with the problems with freedom of expression because it was my husband who was a YouTube blogger who traveled around the country just asking people about their attitude to the government, about their level of life, you know, would they agree or disagree, and he was detained for this immediately. And that's why I, I uh, ran, uh, uh, you know, I... I uh, uh, put my documents instead of him to become president of the country. So Belarus uh, is the country uh, with the, where the most uh, journalists are in prison per, cap per capita in the world. So in Belarus, about 40 uh, journalists are recognized as political prisoners, and this number is growing. About 3,000 uh, media outlets and websites are recognized as um, um, uh, as extremists. So people in Belarus, while they're reading alternative news or looking for alternative information, they also can be recognized as extremists. So people, uh, you know, are afraid even, you know, to, to, to read or to like or to retweet or whatever. So, uh, and it's uh, tools of uh, tyrants, it's tools of dictators. They're really scared of uh, uh, opinion of people and they want to suppress, uh, to suppress people for them, not even, you know, have a wish uh, to watch something else than just propaganda, TV or media. So there's like the official opinion and what, that what the people think they don't express. Absolutely. They don't dare to express that freely. Okay, there will be even parliamentary, so-called parliamentary elections in Belarus. Do you see any chance of change in your home country or for change? So this so-called, uh, as you correctly said, parliamentary elections, it's nothing like, uh, nothing but farce, imitation, uh, I know, theater, circus, but uh, has nothing to do with elections. And people in Belarus understand this. And uh, these so-called elections cannot be turning point uh, in, uh, in Belarus. So uh, people might sacrifice their freedom and lives uh, in vain, like participating or not participating in this election. So we are uh, asking people uh, not to um, vote at all because it doesn't change anything in our country. Uh, Lukashenko put his uh, like pocket parliament, designate uh, his po pocket parliament and will not change anything. But we are asking people to be involved in politics uh, through different means, you know, to uh, continue and resist and groundly, to read honest news, to deliver uh, news from inside Belarus to outlets that have mm -hmm. to relocate after 2020. We actually call Belarusian people um, our, um, like, uh, national, uh, national uh, intelligence or public in intelligence or people's intelligence. People now in Belarus, they are our local journalists. Though they don't have such profession, they inform us about the situation. You know, they collect information absolutely. and inform and send, the opposition. Yeah? Send it to uh, media in exile. Because in Belarus now only, uh, you know, media can't work at all. And those uh, media that have been relocated since 2020, they can uh, broadcast through YouTube, through Telegram channels, so we don't have opportunity to broadcast on TV. It's mm -hmm. fully under uh, under influence of uh, regime, but still we are looking for new opportunities. We're using TikTok, all the possible platforms okay. uh, to talk to people. Okay. Thank you, Svetlana. A question now to Joe. Joe, the job of journalist is, of course, also to hold powerful people to account to report about problems and so on. But at the same time now, even though we are doing this, we see the rise of autocrats. So are we journalists failing? I wouldn't say that uh, journalists are failing per se. I think the, uh, 
the description of the deterioration of uh, the environment for free speech, free press, and independent organizations in a number of societies uh, is connected with the decline of free media and an independent free press is an essential component of having a free society. Uh, but having an independent free press obviously is not a sufficient guarantee to produce a free society. And the reason that you see a lot of repression of journalists, the jailing of journalists, the killing of journalists, uh, the pressure on institutions that produce journalism in multiple societies around the world is precisely because they are a contributor to a free and democratic society. So I don't think that you can say that journalists have failed because there's a deterioration in, in democracy. I think that you're seeing repression of journalists and journalism precisely because of the same trend that you're describing here, which is authoritarian leaders are taking advantage uh, of multiple situations, including cultural divisions, political divisions, uh, to repress free expression in multiple societies around the world, to control uh, the, the independent free press or to take away the independence of the press. Um, in other words, I, I see uh, open discussion, uh, open reporting as a contributor to a greater uh, free expression and, and freedom in society. But I also see the same trend that you're describing in terms of repression as hurting and repressing the free press. So it's more and more difficult now for journalists to do their job nowadays. Yeah? Do you feel this also with your journalists in certain uh, I regions? I think it's, it's more difficult for journalists to do their job uh, than it has been certainly in the last 20 or 30 years in multiple places around the world. It's certainly more difficult uh, uh, to, as an international news organization, organization to dispatch our journalists. Uh, the, the safety situation, the credentialing of journalists around the world has become significantly more difficult. I mean, today, uh, most big international news organizations have had to radically reduce the staff that they have in Russia and in China. So those traditionally are two of the biggest uh, postings for international journalists around the world. Both of them have been radically reduced. It's become more difficult to be uh, an international journalist or a domestic journalist in India, the world's largest democracy. Uh, I think we're seeing deterioration essentially everywhere, and it's connected with the same trend uh, that you're describing. I do think that even in that environment, good uh, journalism domestically and globally is contributing to people's awareness of the threat that we're describing today uh, and will continue to contribute to that, and I don't, I'm not entirely pessimistic that we can see, uh, you know, some degree of positive change. Uh, we heard a little bit about the situation in Poland. The situation in Poland has shifted recently with, with the Law and Justice Party losing its control over all the institutions of Polish society uh, and seeing the opposition or a group of opposition parties come into power. I think we've seen some progress in places like Colombia. Uh, and, and I believe, you know, there can continue, as long as journalists are doing the job of exposing corruption, showing the effects of collusion that exist when authoritarian leaders and their cronies come into powerful positions, that will have an impact over time uh, and, and, and will help inform people's decision making about what kind of government they want and the kind of participation they want in their own societies. Thank you, Joe. Tirana, you described the global landscape, the difficult global landscape, very well. What kind of strategies should we develop to tackle the rise of autocrats, for example? I mean, I think that, you know, Joe was just saying that, you know, journalists, and we we're talking about civil society, plays a role in this. And we need to ensure that we're not just relying on what is happening in countries as crises are emerging, as rights are actually being are regressing. We need to ensure that the friends of those governments, whether they be economic friends, trade friends, we need to be leveraging whatever power we have to hold those governments to account. And there's another there's another disturbing trend that we're seeing across the global landscape, and that is governments saying, throwing their hands in the air saying, well, it's all just too hard. And that's just not true. 
There are ways to engage before we hit the crisis point. There are canaries in the coal mine, so to speak, early indicators. When, as I discussed, when you start seeing attacks on women's rights, reproductive rights, the LGBT community, migrants, refugees, those are the first indications of the rise of an anti-rights agenda and often the early indications of authoritarianism and they can emerge in democracies. That's when action needs to be taken because if you do not hold governments to account for those sort of regressions, then they go one step further because they feel emboldened and then they start going for the institutions, then they start going for the free press. Then they start going for the independence of the judiciary. <laughs> then they'll start going for silencing political opposition. And that is when we end up in crisis. That's when we move from a regression in human rights to full-blown autocracy. And that is not a trend that is inevitable. That can be changed through the actions of governments across the world and prioritizing human rights, open societies, uh, and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, you can ask one or two questions if you like, but first of all, I would like another question to, then I come to you, to Svetlana. Svetlana, holding the governments to account, do you feel enough support by the international community? Because you just described how difficult it is also for you personally and for all the people in Belarus. So what kind of support are you, do you wish for? Uh, you know, first of all, I want to uh, underline that, of course, Belarus now uh, not in like the focus because so many events mm. are happening in the world, and we know that attention span is rather short uh, in the world. Uh, and of course, it's our task to increase attention to our country, to the situation, to um, abuse of human rights and political prisoners, so on and so forth. What we want from the world, we want uh, from political world, we want decisiveness because we see how weakness of uh, institutions uh, you know, or undecisiveness of uh, politicians or absence of political will uh, is perceived as a weakness by dictators. And they uh, like, uh, think, they feel impunity, impunity for their actions. They can and do what they want. Absolutely, without any attention. That's why they ruin uh, media, first of all, in uh, dictatorship, you know, for the world not to see what's going on in, in countries. In Belarus, uh, every day in our country, 15, 20 people are being detained for the anti-regime or uh, anti-war position. Does the world know about this? No, because we don't have journalists on the ground. And uh, uh, so that's why we, we, we know about this, but we can't, can't show pictures. You know, and the world sometimes is, is thinking only, uh, you know, on the ground of uh, beautiful pictures, you know, or pictures of atrocities. But if they don't have not, they don't have anything to visualize. They they think that the problem doesn't exist. Uh, so that you know, international media is so important for the cases like in Belarus. Uh, you have to collaborate with uh, democratic forces, you know, to ask our opinion, to uh, keep, uh, to highlight, you know, the, um, the, the, the tension in our country, to highlight abuses of human rights. And uh, when Belarus is in media, it means that it will be on the tables of, of uh, politicians. And what we ask, we ask for more political and economical pressure on the regime. Uh, we see how... Um, uh, Russia and the Russian regime using each other uh, just to create loopholes in sanctions, and they, they continue to trade with the world. Uh, then we need accountability. Uh, Lukashenko committed many, many crimes in our country. It's crimes against humanity, it's torturing people, migration crisis, hijacking airplane, participation in the war, uh, abduction of Ukrainian children, and we are begging for launching a special investigation on his crimes. Mm -hmm. Why? It's, it's still not, it hasn't been done yet. Yeah. Why? Uh, it's about, uh, you know, efficiency of international institutions. Then we need uh, support to people, support to civil society. We can sustain, but we need to win this war. And we need assistance, first of all, to our media. And now when I see that in Belarus, uh, assistance to media is, uh, from, from the democratic uh, world is reduced, 
uh, I'm shocked because how can we deliver news about Belarus to you if we don't have enough support and enough assistance for mm. our media? Mm. And it's also commitment. You know, Belarus chose, uh, Belarusian people actually chose uh, uh, European path of development and we need support of this path from uh, international media and of course from uh, European politicians. Okay. Thank you, Svetlana. Now, please, uh, your question and... I think you get a mic. Do you see generational differences as to where the public goes for their information? And um, certain generations may go to the New York Times or, you know, press, and others will go to influencers and bloggers or just certain TV stations that you can hear two different opinions and you're talking to someone you really don't know if they're on the right planet or not. So. Um, you know, respectful journalism is important, but are they going to the source? Is this question to Joe or? Okay, Joe, would you like to take it? Uh, sure, I mean, y yes, trying to broaden the demographics of the readership for quality information is the obligation and the, and the interest of every major news organization and trying to reach uh, Younger readers or those who are not as uh, inclined to come to traditional sources is one of the things we're, we're working hard on. I don't think that there is a barrier uh, to good quality information from leading news organizations per se. I do think you're right that the traditional habits of reading, you know, certainly print newspapers is, is something that is now confined to a very specific, you know, generation of people and hasn't, is not a tradition that has continued. But even navigating directly to websites uh, uh, and, and going to broadcast television outlets also is, is something that's sort of demographically differentiated. I do think when we have, you know, put our journalism into forms that work for a broader audience, a younger demographic uh, on platforms like TikTok or Instagram. The response to it tends to be pretty good. Uh, there is a hunger for good quality information. There's a hunger to know more about the journalists who are producing it uh, and, and being more transparent and open and producing in the forms that people of every generation want to consume their news and information in is kind of an obligation on us because the audience is there for it. Thank you, Joe. Um, we can take one more very brief question because uh, we have to come to an end then and we have very important closing remarks as well. Uh, hello, I'm Sajini I'm with Global Shaper from Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, I'm a Sri Lankan and uh, our Prime Minister is here and the Prime Minister of Vietnam is here. So there have been serious issues about freedom of expression in Sri Lanka, especially very recently we had this online safety bill coming which hindered, which hindered the freedom of expression deeply. And uh, in Vietnam, I got to know uh, at COP where uh, certain climate lawyers have been arrested, still in jail. So have there been discussions between the, the NGOs or the human rights bodies here and these leaders who ultimately kind of make these decisions in spaces like this, where you kind of mingle all together. Uh, I want to know what steps have been taken. Thank you. I think it's very important that we have this discussion here now that just shows that there are discussions, but Tirana, probably you like to take that? Sure. Um, you will not maybe be surprised that certain leaders who tend to have uh, less rights respecting or autocratic tendencies um, aren't as willing as to find time in their schedules to meet with, um, with civil society and human rights organisations. That said, we do, try, we do meet with, um, with governments uh, not just here, this is a particular fora, but consistently through the year, um, particularly not only after bills have actually been introduced, but before, as soon as the draft legislation goes into action, you know, hu international human rights organisations like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International and others will be working with, you know, Sri Lankan organisations, Vietnamese human rights organisations who are under extraordinary pressure by these repressive governments because they are trying to hold them to account to actually engage in discussions, speak to lawmakers and actually stop the laws before they pass. 
one of the things I would say about this, these laws that we're seeing in Sri Lanka, it's not just about Sri Lanka. It is across Asia, it is across Latin America, it is even in Australia, the UK and the US. There are these permissive broad laws all introduced for our security, which essentially can be used by governments to silent dissent and critics through online discussions mm -hmm. and freedom of speech online. So we need to work um, and keep a very close eye on yeah. ensuring that we stop this regression in the digital space. It's incredibly yeah. harmful. Yes, we see this in Turkey as well just recently, for example, yeah. Thank you very much, Tirana, Svetlana and Joe. And now we come to our closing remarks and I would like to ask Tachi Ramani uh, to join us on the stage uh, here with uh, his translator. And Mr. Ramani is a re Iranian uh, journalist, writer, political activist, and his wife, as you sure, I'm uh, sure you know, Nagis Muhammadi, is actually uh, being held in prison in Iran, in the notorious Evin prison. And she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for her work in fighting for women's rights. And uh, her teenage children accepted the award for her last year, uh, and so please. Uh, hi to everyone, and thank you for inviting me here. آزادی بیان جامعه مدنی و سرمایه جهانی شده در جهانی جهانی شده زندگی میکنیم مرزها دچار تغییر و تعریف شدیدی شدند مشخص نیست مرز ملی کجاست سرمایه جهانی با رسانه ها دچار تحول و تغییر شده است برخی از این تغییرات به دلیل نامشخص بودن نگران کننده هستند اما در حال انجام هستند مدل های اقتصادی و نظرات فلسفی توان توضیح روابط و مناسبات اجتماعی جدید را ندارد به عبارتی تکنیک از تفکر جلو زده است تفکر و ایده باید برای کنترل این تکنولوژی چاره بیاندیشد اجلاس های سالانه در داوودس این ادعا را با خود هم می کند اما آیا موفق بوده است جواب را به متخصصان باز می دارم how supporting free expression and civil society in, in Iran benefits the world globalization has changed the lines between nation and reshapes the world. The media and the flow of money have created new realities and challenge. Technology has changed the way we interact and relate to each other. Our old theories and concepts cannot keep us with this change. We need to think of new way to manage and use technology wisely. The world leaders who met in Davos every year say they want to do this, but are they really doing this, doing like this? I will let the expert judge that today I want to talk about how freedom of speech, civil society, and globalized capital affect my own region and my own country. I have seen two eras of intellectual life in Iran, and I know the first era from the story of those who live it. Free Freedom of speech in our country has always been threatened. Let me start from the 17 years ago to make the problem well understood. I'm going to talk about the country and the country of my own. I was the president of the country and the country. I was the president of the country in Iran. I was the president of the country. I was the president of the country. The freedom of speech in our country has always been threatened. بگذارید از هفتاد سال پیش شروع کنم تا مشکل بهتر درک شود بعد از کودتای 28 مرداد 1332 کشور ما دوچار حوادثی سخت بوده که 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 اون را از توسعه و صلح دور کرده بعد از اون کودتا رابطه ایران با غرب دچار نوسان شد و امروز هم حکومت استبدادی بر اساس تبعیض در ایران بنا شده است و گذار از این حکومت ضروری است این حکومت آزادی بدیان را جرم میداند و نهادهای مدنی را سرکوب می کند از تعارض سیاست های غرب در منطقه استفاده می کند تا 
دیکتاتوری خود را تحکیم کند مردم ما صلح توسعه میخواهند آزادی بیان به دموکراسی کمک میکند After the coup d'état of August 1953, our country has faced challenging events that have kept it from development and peace. Since then, Iran's relations with the West have been fluctuating. Today, the government is authoritarian and built on discrimination and transitioning from uh, its, its necessary. This government criminalizes criminalize freedom of speech and suppress civil institution. It exploits the contradiction and failure of Western policies in the region to stabilize his own dictatorship, increasing instability in the whole region. We dream of a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic Iran. We know that without freedom of speech, there is no democracy possible. آزادی بیان دروازه دموکراسی است. من به خاطر این بسته بودن دروازه چهارده سال زندان کشیدم و دوازده سال است که تبعید هستم. همسرم نرگس محمدی سالهاست به علت فعالیت مدنی در زندان است. البته این سرنوشت ما تنها نیست بلکه سرنوشت مشترک هر ایرانی است که به آزادی بیان اعتقاد دارد. اما چرا چنین است؟ آزادی بیان بستر و حامی و عینی میخواهند و اون بستر جامعه مدنی و نهادهای مدنی مستقل از دولت است بدون آزادی بدون نهاد مدنی و جامعه مدنی آزادی بیان ممکن نیست اما حکومت ها در منطقه ما با آزادی بیان مخالفند پس نهادهای مدنی را سرکوب میکنند ما در ایران نهادهای مدنی مقاوم داریم که در مقابل حکومت میستند اما حکومت ها در منطقه از تعارضی استفاده میکنند که منافع دولت های غربی ایجاد میکند زمانی نفت و انرژی ارزان و, با و بازار مصرف برای حفظ ثبات سیاسی اقتصادی در غرب عامل اصلی تعامل و تعامل با حکومت های ما در منطقه بود در این مواجهه جامعه مدنی ما زیر فشار میرفت این قاعده که حکومت های منطقه چه مخالف و چه موافق با قرب هستن جای تبدیل که نتیجهش قربانی شدن آزادی مردم ما We have paid a high price for speaking our minds. I personally spent 40 years in jail and 20 Uh, 12 years in exile. My wife, Nargis Mohammadi, is still behind bars for her civic work. But we are not alone. Many Iranians share our struggle and our hope for freedom of speech in Iran. What is the reason for this? Freedom of speech cannot exist without a strong and concrete foundation. That foundation is a vibrant civil society and a civil institution that is free from government or state interference. But why it's so? Freedom of speech needs a supportive environment and strong foundation. And that foundation is a vibrant so civil society. Freedom of speech and security depend on a strong and independent civil society and public institution. But the government in our region do not want that so they crush any civic voice or organization in Iran we keep fighting back we have periodic movement that call for a democratic and uncountable government the government in our region exploit conflict that serves the interest of the West in their own advantage the West has to frequently only cared about cheap oil oil and energy to keep its own stability and prosperity It, dot, it, dot, it did not care how it dealt with go government in our region, whether friendly or hostile. This earned our civil society and our, our rights. We need to pay attention to this pattern of this dictatorship and oppression in Iran, no matter who supports it, because it hurts our freedom of our people. Okay. 
آزادی بیان به قدرت یافتن جامعه مدنی نیاز دارد کاره چاره کار جنگ و تحریم مردم نیست چاره کار تقویت مردم و جامعه مدنی است مثلا مردم ما به آزادی اینترنت نیاز دارند تا جلو انحصار حکومت را بگیرند در این مورد به ما کمک کنید شما را به تغییر راهبردی برای آزادی بیان و اتخاذ سیاست های من مهم در منطقه دعوت می کنیم ما همه سوار یک قطار هستیم کمک کنیم به آزادی و دموکراسی در ایران و منطقه ما کمک کنیم تا همه امنیت داشته باشیم To finish and to conclude, in Iran, to have freedom of speech, we need a strong and active civil society. The answer is not to harm or isolate our people with war and sanction, but to support them and their civic organization. For instance, how people need access to free internet without government censorship. Please help us to achieve this. How people also need to connect with the rest of the world to resist government in position. I urge you to rethink our global strategy from freedom of speech and to take concrete steps to support free expression and civil society. I say this again because it matters. We, uh, we are all this in together and helping freedom of democracy in Iran and our in region is also good for your own security. We need more than words. We need real actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Armani.